Mr. Kaziba, you, bit, you need to mute yourself on the entrepreneurship side because we are hearing okay. that. Sure, Gloria, we can start. It's okay. Mr. Kaziba, maybe let me try using my side. Ngarama SS in Isinjiro District, and I have the pleasure to take you through today's facilitation for chemistry paper two at UCE level. If you are not is sharing the screen, to hear now? you can hear, but the screen is not seen. The video, maybe okay. if it's a video. For starters, this paper is composed of two sections. Section A, which is composed of short responses, and it carries a total of 50 marks, and these are usually distributed over 10 questions. While section B is composed of four questions for extended responses, and you will choose only two, where you will have to work out of 30 marks, and this gives our paper a total of 80 marks. My dear learners, always remember to read the instructions carefully before you start to attempt the questions in the paper. You never know, maybe the instructions may change. So do not rely on the instructions which you are used to. The theme for our facilitation is how to interpret the different action verbs as used in the paper. I hope you will enjoy our session. You are Teacher Gloria. Teacher Gloria. Yes, please. Yes, can I share and we talk and you talk uh, about it? Okay. Mm, I think uh, we shall be on a better side. So let me share and then we, you start again. Without okay. that. Okay. Action without is it now there? Yes, I can see it. First wait. Hope this is the one without the audio. Okay, let us start again. Okay, I welcome everyone to our facilitation for today. And like I said, today we are going to look at the action verbs which we use in chemistry, paper two, which is paper, which is five, four, five stroke two. On our screens, we can see the first slide, which shows us the first action verb that you are likely to encounter. And that action verb is name. When a learner is requested to name in this paper, that is chemistry paper two, we only expect a correctly spelled name. This means that you're not required to write the chemical formula at any one time, and neither are you allowed to write both the name and the formula. Why is it that you're not allowed to write the name and the formula? Because the question was very clear it required only a name to be written. So if you put a formula and you put the name, the examiner does not know if you really know the difference between a name and a formula. So that is it about writing a name in chemistry paper two. We can move to the next slide.
Next slide. Yes. On our next slide, we have an example that requires you to give a name. If you read through the question, it asks a learner to identify the conducting particles in copper metal and molten copper two chloride, which are both known to conduct electricity. In part A, the name of the conducting particles for electricity in copper metal is required. And from our lessons, we have learned that it is the delocalized electrons. The words delocalized and electrons must be correctly spelled. If you decide to represent electrons with an E, that E with a dash at the top, that one is not a name and your answer will be wrong. In part B, for example, the expected responses could be copper to ions or chloride ions, written, written out clearly in words and not in symbols. Similarly, you shall not at any one time write both the name and the symbol. If you do that, then your name will be wrong. Now we have some technical names, which we must be very careful when we are spelling. For example, there is a very close similarity between ion, which is a charged particle, and ion, which is a metal. In case the answer is for ion, and you erroneously write it as ion, then you will be having a mistake in your name, and your answer will be wrong. Other, the slides are running too fast, Mr. Kaziwa. Okay. It is okay. So when you're writing words like saponification, if you add there any A, even if it is related to the manufacture of soap and you call it saponification, then you will be having a problem with the spelling of your name. Another example is the difference between polyester and polyester. One of those spellings that is polyester, it is commonly used in English when we are writing English. But in chemistry, the word is not polyester, but rather polyester. Then the same thing applies to polythene, which must be polyethene and not polythene. Polythene is the normal English that people write, and that's not chemistry. On our current slide, we now want to look at the use of trivial names. What is a trivial name? Trivial names, these are names which are not part of the systematic nomenclature used in chemistry. Names like lime water, these names are not allowed. In the only instance where we can allow these names is when we are dealing with numbers that come from applied chemistry. For example, one of the ores of iron is known to be hematite, which is a trivial name for iron theory oxide. And since the extraction of metals is coming from applied chemistry, it is okay to write the name of the ore as hematite because the extraction of iron is coming from, or from applied chemistry. But if the question is not coming from applied chemistry, please make sure that you write the systematic name and not the real name. Next slide. As we wait for the next slide, please, if the question requires you to write a name, let it be a name. And 
you must write the systematic name. Now here we have the use of abbreviations. In this paper, it is a general principle that you do not use abbreviations. So when writing the names of substances, you must avoid abbreviations such as PPT, CONC, RXN to mean reaction, DIL to mean dilute, SOLN to mean solution. Please, you should desist from using those abbreviations. You have to write out the name of the substance in full. When you look at our example on the screen, we are required to name a drying agent for oxygen gas. And from our knowledge of chemistry, concentrated sulfuric acid could be a suitable answer to that question. And when you're writing that, you must make sure that the word concentrated is in full and not abbreviated. Sulfuric acid should be the name and not the symbol. So for a learner who writes conk H2SO4, they already have two mistakes in their answer. Number one, they have not used a name. And number two, they have used an abbreviation in the word concentrated. Please do not make those mistakes when you are answering questions surrounding name in paper two, chemistry at all level. Okay. Now we have our second action verb. I hope everyone can clearly see our screens right now. And the second action verb is where we are tasked to write the formula. In this case, only the formula will be a correct answer. If you write a name, it is not okay. Even writing both the name and the formula is not okay. Why? Because we are not sure if you really know the difference between the name and a formula. The formulae are written using symbols and the symbols must be correct. I encourage my dear learners to practice your symbols for elements like chlorine, potassium, lead, iron, and magnesium. In questions where, sorry, I want you to talk to your teachers such that you can find out how to correctly write these symbols. They are very tricky and they are a source of errors in this paper. Chlorine, potassium, lead, iron, and magnesium. Then we have questions where they use letters to represent the substances or the elements. In case they use these capital letters, please stick to the capital letters that you have been given. Even if you know, for example, if they use atomic number, even if you know the element to which the atomic number belongs, do not write the symbol, the systematic symbol for the what? For the element. Use the letter which has been given. I hope I'm giving you time to digest that. And as we look at our examples, when you're given a question, you have to read the question carefully so that you exhaust all the answers. Because it is required maybe a mixture of more than one thing. In the examples on our screen, the first question requires a learner to write the formula of rust. When you look at that question, only the formula is required. Then when you go to the second question, they want a learner to name an iron ore and write its formula. If you read the question very fast, you may skip one of them. So here you can write the name of the iron ore as hematite, it is allowed because it is applied chemistry, or you can write iron three oxide, it is also okay, it is a systematic name for the hematite ore. And then you clearly write it C name. Then in the third example, they have used the symbols which are not the usual symbols of the elements. They have used the letter M and letter Y for elements whose atomic numbers are 12 and 8. As you're writing your answer, even if you know those particular elements for those atomic numbers, stick to the letters which have been given in the what? In the question for you to write the formula of the compound.
Okay. Our third action verb is identify. When you're told you to identify, this one is very friendly because you can choose to either write the name or the formula. However, I wouldn't encourage anyone to write both. Why? This is because if unfortunately one of them is wrong, then everything will be wrong. Yes, when they tell you to identify, you can either write the name or the formula. If you choose to write both, make sure they are both correct. But if one of them is wrong, it is going to cancel out the other correct answer. So think carefully, think clearly, and write only one of them. Even the time, there is no time. This paper needs a lot of thinking. Why should you write both? Use that time to go and read other questions and do other questions in the paper. Let's look at an example for identify, for us to understand it very well. Let's look at an example in our next slide. Yes, I don't know if the screen is large enough, but in this question, a learner has been tested to identify a metal X, which forms a black solid when heated in plenty of oxygen. Our knowledge of reaction of metals with air or oxygen will help us to know that the metal is actually copper. And since the question requires you to identify, you can either write the word copper, correctly spelled, or the symbol for copper. Any of them is correct. If you decide to write the name, the spelling must be correct. And if you choose to write the symbol, it must also be correct. Similarly, if you decide to write both, it must be the correct spelling for the name and the correct symbol. If one of them comes out wrongly, then you will be in very big trouble. So you can see some of the causes of losing marks. There the learner may write the word copper with a single P. There you have the name wrong. And then there is a learner who could write a small C and then a capital U or write that symbol very wrongly. Like when you join the C and the U, that will be a wrong symbol. And if you pair them, like that one having the correct name copper, but then a wrong symbol, then you're going to get your answer wrong. And then the other one who has the symbol correct, but then the name is wrong and has written both, then we cannot decide for you. One of them is wrong. We don't know what you meant. We don't want to choose for you. I hope you get that one very clearly. Mm. I read through your questions later. I will read and respond to the questions later. So on our next slide, we have a very important characteristic of chemistry as a subject, which is writing equations. And in case you're required to write an equation, you have to look out for the following. The use of correct symbols, the use of correct states and making sure that you balance your equation. In total, this will go for one and a half marks in most cases, but we have some other equations where it's not necessarily one and a half marks, but these are the most common ones. And I'm going to explain something about that one and a half marks. You may quarrel with your teacher about misallocation of your marks, and yet it, the problem is with your answer. So on our next slide, I explain the distribution of the one and a half marks. The first full mark, that is a whole mark, it cannot be broken up. Uh, it is for a well-balanced equation with the right symbols. Your reactants and your products, they have the right symbols which are correct written very well, taking into consideration those weird, those a bit tricky elements like iron. And on top of that, 
Those symbols in the equation must all be correctly balancing on the right and left side. Then the other half, which is a half, goes for the states, that is the state symbols. However, that half a mark for symbols is only awarded to a well-balanced correct equation. If the equation is not there, as in it is not correct, it is not balanced, the examiner will not even bother themselves awarding the half a mark for the state symbols. So you must have all the physical states of the substances in the reaction correct, and they must be written very well. In one of the future slides, I'm going to talk about these state symbols and why they may be a problem when you're writing these equations. And I hope you will have enough time to practice them out in case you have been doing it wrongly. So therefore, for your equation, make sure it is the right substances in the reaction. They are well balanced on the reactant and product side, and then they have the correct symbols. Those are the conditions for you to score the one and a half marks. Let me talk about a certain class of equations which come in organic chemistry. In case you find an equation and then they have awarded it only one mark, where is the half a mark going? These equations are usually allocated one mark because the, the state symbols are not usually emphasized. You, can, you are only required to write a balanced equation for your reaction. You don't have to bother with the state symbols. However, however, in case you decided to indicate the state symbols, then they will be taken into consideration. And in case any of them is wrong, then the, but the equation is balanced, then you will take only half a mark. I don't know if you understand me. You have a well-balanced equation, it is organic chemistry, state symbols are not necessary, but you decided to indicate them they will pull that half a mark to the state symbols. And if any of them is wrong, is missing, it is misplaced, then you will lose that half a mark towards your state symbols. But for the correctly balanced equation in the remaining part, they will award you your half a mark. I want you to always remember that. Now let's look at the format of an equation, whether organic, or inorganic. You should not forget that in an equation, the reactants must always be on the left side while the products are on the right. Sometimes you may find that you have a very long equation and cannot fit on one line. In case that one happens, you have to make sure that the products do not cross over to the side of the reactants. If the products have not been able to fit on the line, simply come down onto the next line and write in front of the arrow. Do not come behind the arrow. Because if you come behind the arrow, then we shall look at those substances as reactants and not products, which will make the reaction very wrong. Secondly, you have to be very careful with the placement of the state symbols. In most cases, you have been told to write them as a subscript immediately after the formula of the substance. But it is okay for you to write them on the same line as the formula. If you insert them on the same line, it is very, very okay. However, a lot of caution must be taken when writing the L for liquid. It should not be a capital L, it should not have a sharp corner, and neither should it look like a small a capital I. That curve on L must come out very clearly. You should also remember that both molecular and ionic equations are okay. And another thing I would like to remind you is about on when it comes to the position of the state symbols, they should not go below the line on which the formulae are sitting. If they go below, that one is also a very wrong position for them. In this example, okay, on our previous screen, yes, we have an example whereby the learner is asked to write an equation for the reaction between copper to carbonate and dilute hydrochloric acid. 
they have not specified which kind of equation you should write. So writing a molecular equation, which is on at the top of our answer, it is okay. Also writing an ionic equation, which is down, it is okay. Any of them will score you your one and a half marks. But if the question was to write ionic equation, then only the lower equation would be correct. Then we have instances where the learners decided to show how they derive their ionic equations, to show the ions present in the different substances and then canceling out the spectator ions. In such a case, if you are one of those learners who do that, make sure you underline your final equation. Because in this case, we are seeing a series of equations and the learner and the learner and the I, rather the examiner cannot tell which of those series of equations you're writing is the one which one of them is an ionic equation and they don't want to choose for you so whichever your answer is at the end of the day you have to underline it okay next I will respond to your questions in due time. Next, let's look at another verb which calls for stating what is observed. When a question requires you to state what is observed, use simple words to write it down. Only those aspects which are observable what do we call the observable aspects? These are things which can be heard, they can be seen, they can be smelled. Those are what we call the observable changes. And as a guideline, when you're writing this observation, point out the initial appearance of the substances, then write a statement about any intermediate changes that happen during the reaction, and then finally, write something about the final appearance of the products, that is when the, when the reaction has ceased. And since these questions are always tagged with equations, and the equation usually comes in the next section if it is a question that part A, part B, if part A is for observation, in most cases, part B is talking about writing an equation. The equation is a very good tool you can use to provide guidance when you're writing these observations. So first read the whole question from part A up to the final part, then write down the equation. Even if the equation has not been asked, you can go at the end of the paper. There is some free space there, write the equation and then let the equation give you some guidance on some expected observations. When you're writing these observations, avoid writing the names of the substances. Why? This is to minimize errors. Look at this example. You may have an observation of bubbles of a colorless gas. Then you go ahead and you tell us that your bubbles of a colorless gas are for carbon dioxide. Yet the gas was actually oxygen. In such a case, even if bubbles of a colorless gas is a correct observation, the fact that you are pairing it with a wrong substance makes it wrong. Moreover, it was unnecessary for you to mention the name of the substance. Only the observation was required. So when you're writing these observations, do not bother with naming the substances. I hope you will remember that. And I have given you a reason why. So I let you, I don't know if you can read through some examples of how to write the observations. And in these questions, I want to, I have written there some answers and I want you to observe how the observations have been written in a simple language, but direct to the point and very accurate. You do not have to use that call, that conk English when you're writing these observations. For example, when they tell you to write the observation when 
what is to state what is observed when copper to carbonate is heated strongly. Like I said, write down the initial appearance. We know that copper to carbonate is a green powder. I'm assuring you, mentioning that copper to carbonate is a green powder. Don't even mention the name. Simply say green powder. There will be a mark for that. Turns, that turning, you know. It's not that you will see a green powder, then all of a sudden there is a black, there will be that turning. That turning is an intermediate thing which is happening. Write it down. You will score something for turning. And then as it is heated, the residue will be a black solid. We know that black solid is copper oxide. Yes, we know, but don't mention it. Because in case you mention it wrongly, then you're going to kill your answer of the black residue. I think you can see how I have canceled out the copper to oxide, meaning that it is not necessary for you to put it there. Notice the initial appearance, the intermediate changes that occur, and then the final appearance. That is a very good guideline that can help you when you're writing these observations. Okay. I think you can read through the rest and the answers are very simple and direct. Using a simple language is key. I think we can move to the next slide. Is it okay? All right, thank you. On this slide, on this slide, we are going to look at another action verb and that action verb is define. Other aspects I can put together with this action verb are those ones which like what is, state this law, all of those ones can be explained under this same thing. First of all, they are very common. And when these questions appear, what must you do? What do we want? We only want a brief meaning of the term. But much as only a brief meaning is required, in these definitions, the examiners will look out for keywords which must be mentioned. And then you must remember that for the definition, there is nothing like breaking up the marks that maybe the definition is two marks, then we can give one mark for doing this, then another mark for doing this, no. If it is one mark, it is for everything being, name, being stated correctly. If it is two marks, the two marks are awarded to the whole definition. So, you must make sure that you have a collection of all the required keywords in the definition, and then you must state them in a meaningful way. I can share with you an example, although it is not in our presentation. For example, when you're told to, oh, it is okay. It's okay, it's there to define the word electrolyte. If you read through the answer for the definition of the word electrolyte, the answer shows all the required aspects. It leaves no room, but what about this? What if this, you know? Never leave the examiner in that balance. Mention everything, write it meaningfully. Then when you look at the definition for rate of chemical reaction. The concept of time, the concept of the relationship between time and the formation of products is what we are likely to look out for. We have different textbooks writing these definitions in different ways. But in such a case, we shall see, is the student showing that the rate of a chemical reaction must bring out a relationship between time taken for products to be formed. Whichever way you write it, does the meaning come out in that way? So it does not matter 
read whichever book you're reading, but when you reach the definition, make sure that your definitions have all the key words. These ones you can share with your teachers. They can help you to identify these key words. Then when you look at the definition for oxide, I underlined the word only. Why have I underlined it? It is for purposes of emphasis. When you're defining the word oxide as a compound formed between any element and oxygen and you stop there, that is not correct because we have many other compounds in which elements can combine with oxygen. But in this case, it must be with the oxygen only, any element and oxygen only. So if the word only is missing, you are giving us that incomplete answer, incomplete meaning. You started well, but you are not finishing well. So when you're reading these definitions and you see that the different textbooks are defining in different ways, work together with your teachers to harmonize the keywords in these definitions. Okay. Next, another action verb that you are likely to encounter is a state or give a difference. When you are asked to give a difference, you write something short but very precise. It can be in a statement form. In most cases, if more than one difference is required, if you use a table, it will be a very useful tool. Why? First of all, the whole difference must be correct for you to score, meaning that the statements on either side, because you are giving a difference, you are comparing two things. So the statements you make for each of those things, for each of those items must be correct. That is one. Number two, the difference must be harmonious, meaning it must match on either side. For example, what am I saying? Elana may be told to write the difference between an acid and an alkali. If you say an acid turns blue litmus paper red, while an alkali turns litmus, red litmus paper blue, that is both correct and it is harmonious. But look at this statement. Acids turn litmus paper red, which is correct. While alkalis contain hydroxide ions, which is also correct. But that difference is not harmonious. And that is when the table will come in very handy. It will help you to see that you are comparing matching items. So you should not forget that in the difference, it must be correct and it must be harmonious. And if more than one is required, it is okay for you to use a table, most especially in section B. Now let's look at drawings. Drawings. For any drawing made in this paper, which in most cases is for setups of experiments, we can have preparation of gases. You should note the following. Your drawing must be fully labeled with the names. I emphasize the names. Don't use the formula and do not write trivial names. And even when you're writing these names, do not use abbreviations. Remember that. Then your apparatus must be in working condition. Yes, the apparatus must be in working condition. What are some of the concepts that surround working apparatus? I want you to watch out for things like clamps, which are supposed to provide support. Make sure that your equipment is lying on the same level. After drawing all your whole thing, your whole setup, get a ruler and make a very clear line to show that all your things have a base on which they are sitting. The gas jars should not be sealed. Leave some space to allow the free circulation of what? 
of air such that as if it's by downward delivery, the air moves out and then your gas is collected into the gas jar. There must be space for the air to move out. Then when it comes to your delivery tubes, they should not be blocked. What are blocked delivery tubes? When you draw your delivery tubes with sharp corners, I want you to try to go to the laboratory and put a sharp corner on your delivery tube. You will notice that it will be blocked. And if it is blocked, will it deliver the gas? Of course not. So will it be working? Of course not. That is why when you draw those sharp corners for your, for your delivery tubes, we shall say that you are missing something on your on working apparatus. Draw your delivery tubes with the very smooth curves. Then the flask should be closed very well. Why should they be closed very well? To prevent escape of gases. So if your, your flasks are not, your flasks actually and wash bottles are not closed very well, you will still miss a mark for working apparatus. Then the delivery tubes in the wash bottles, they must be delivering those substances in the right way. Remember the delivery tubes, they pick a substance from one flask and they take it to another. If the gas is being taken into a wash bottle for drying, that gas must be delivered into the drying agent. So if your delivery tube is not delivering the gas into the drying agent, then you may find that some of the gas may remain around lingering. I think I have said something about that drawings and if you have been making any mistakes you can rectify them now on our screen we have an example of a drawing which was made by elana and that drawing is about the preparation of carbon dioxide gas i cannot say it is totally bad no although it has a number of faults and there are many we have some few good points we can pick from that drawing the delivery tubes are very good. They are working well. The flasks are closed very well. The gas jar is not sealed. So there is free circulation of air. And some of the names have been written well. That is OK. But do you observe the wrong name for the heating flask? Remember our lessons in senior one when we were learning about laboratory apparatus. Those lessons were not for fun. That is a round bottomed flask they have drawn, but then they are labeling it as a flat bottomed flask. Although the name has a very good spelling, it is for the wrong apparatus. Then you notice the use of a trivial name, marble chips, for that solid in that flask. That is also wrong you must only use the systematic names. Then when it comes to the liquid in our funnel, the liquid in our funnel, the learner has used a formula for hydrochloric acid instead of a name. All those are errors which you should desist from making. Then when it comes to our drying agent, we have a wrong no it's not wrong for our drying agent they have used an abbreviation conch conch sulfuric acid the name is okay but that concentrated has been abbreviated that is not okay then in this preparation the student is giving us wrong conditions they are heating the mixture i know this will simply just see make the reaction go faster, but we know that this reaction can proceed at room temperature. So that was not necessary. Then the setup is hanging in space. It's not sitting on any base. You have to draw a line to show these things sitting on the same on a base. If one of them is up, you can support it with a block. For example, maybe you find that you have drawn your gas jar and it's not at the same line. Simply draw a block to touch the base on which all of them are sitting. Then we shall know that the gas jar is being supported by a block. Then when you look at that flask, 
it may not sit on its own since it is a round bottom the flask. When you draw a round bottom the flask, try to support it with a clamp for your apparatus to be in very good working condition. And even part of the setup is missing. We know that the first section for manufacture for, for preparing a gas must be the production. Then we have to remove impurities. This learner did not show us any setup where they are removing impurities from the gas that has been produced. So if the question was requiring a pure sample, then this learner was even going to miss out a mark for the gas which is in the gas jar because it will not be pure carbon dioxide. But I think it can be neglected because the question did not specify a preparation of a pure sample. So this learner will lose many marks, including for working apparatus. Next, let's look at another important action verb, which is describe. In these numbers, the best of practical chemistry is brought out. For those people who have been doing these simple experiments, yes, things will flow very well. So what should you do in such a number? Write down every detail, including diagrams where applicable. For any description, the steps must be systematic. They must be in an orderly manner. What comes after what? What comes next? You must remember that when you're describing. So do not jump onto the number. First, think about it very carefully and organize your ideas in a systematic way. Then the reagents which you are going to use, they must be correct. Use the correct reagents in your descriptions. And the aspects must be explained. And when you're explaining, you must include an equation. Even if the diagram is not required, it must be talked into the description. We shall see an example. And when, excuse me, and when the description, when the description, when only a diagram is required in your description, make sure you draw a talking diagram. Try to learn more about talking diagrams. What are talking diagrams? On the diagram itself, you make annotated notes. For example, in our previous example, where we were preparing carbon dioxide, as you are labeling concentrated sulfuric acid, go on to mention that to dry the gas. That is in cases we are using the diagram only. Give give what is taking place that label must be given meaning when you mention when you write down calcium carbonate instead of marble chips the right thing would have been calcium carbonate tell us calcium carbonate that reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid from the funnel to produce carbon dioxide gas then include a what an equation around that what around that label that is what we call a talking diagram I hope I've explained it clearly. So here we have an example, which we can read through slowly about a description for the preparation of carbon dioxide gas. Yes, I've seen individuals who have been asking for if these slides can be given to them, it is okay. We shall present these slides to you after the presentation. And if you can read through right now, slowly by slowly, you will notice that all the necessary substances have been mentioned. That is where the marks are. I have tried to underline them such that you can see them very fast. The apparatus, I have tried to show all the apparatus that are there in that preparation of carbon dioxide gas in the laboratory. The equation, you must bring it out to show that that is the equation, that's the reaction by which the gas is being produced. Then the explanations, when you come to the bottom, why are you using concentrated sulfuric acid to dry? Because it is hygroscopic and it will not react with the acidic gas. Try to give those explanations. You cannot tell what, is, what the examiner is interested in. Be elaborate. 
the key word here is be elaborate mention everything necessary but do not be worthy when i say be elaborate i'm not saying be worthy uh, uh just be elaborate combine all your ideas in simple statements that are direct to the point that example was about the preparation of gases but that's not all we can go to the next slide we can have other aspects in chemistry where we may be required to describe. We can move to the next slide. We can skip that. It was about a talking diagram. So that was preparation of gases. Now let me talk about other areas in which we can have descriptions. You may be asked to prepare a salt. Remember to be systematic in your description. What do I mean? Let the steps be in an orderly manner. You may also be required to describe an experiment. For example, in rates of chemical reactions, in enthalpy changes. And in these experiments, apart from the systematic steps which you must write down and drawing the setup, you must show how you're going to collect data from your one experiment and how you're going to treat that data to get the results you want. They must all be brought out in your one description. There is also describing simple qualitative tests. And I'm going to talk about these ones elaborately in our next slide. In these simple qualitative tests, what are we going to look out for? Do you have the correct procedure? Do you have the correct reagents? And do you have the correct observations? Whichever way you write your description, for us, we shall look out for those ones. You can write a simple statement and it can have everything. For example, in this question, describe one test in each case that can be carried out to show that hydrated copper to sulfate contains. Let me skip to the to part B, the example for part B, which is copper to ions. I have written there, the answer which I have written there, you can see it mentions the procedure, it mentions the reagents, and then it gives the observation. Please, this has been described. When you're to describe the procedure must come out, the reagents must come out, and then the observation must come out. In this case, the procedure and reagents are in one statement. Add a few drops, no, add drops of ammonia solution to a solution of copper to sulfate in a test tube until in excess. I have put there a semicolon to pause to see, yes, do I have the procedure? It is there. Do I have the reagent? It is there. So I can now go forward and write my observation. A blue precipitate soluble in excess to form a deep blue solution. I used those, I wrote it that way to bring out all the different aspects when you're describing these qualitative tests. But you can have one statement and it can bring out all those aspects. Simply check for the procedure, the reagents, and then the correct observations. Okay. Explaining, explaining. If you are tasked to explain, it means you must give more detail. You must also write equations even when they have not been asked. In questions of explain, the general rules will apply. That is, no abbreviations, no formulae, only names of substances, and then we must have the correct spellings. For such questions, digest the question well before you write, since they usually require a good understanding of the subject matter. I'm going to give an example in the next slide.
In this question, the learners have been asked to explain some of the observations down there. Before you attempt the question, ensure that you are fully conversant with the necessary information, especially from which sections of the subject is this content coming from. It may even be more than one topic in your, in your book. Then after that, look out which aspects do I need to present? And then after getting the aspects that you must present, organize your ideas in a logical way. I'm going to give, okay, let me go through all of them. The first one required to explain why, aqueous, why an aqueous solution of sodium chloride conducts electricity, whereas solid sodium chloride does not. Now, the, answers you, the answer you will write for such a question can come from bonding. It can also come from electrolysis. If you are sure of where the question is coming from, then the question becomes very easy for you. Then when you go to part B, the extensive use of ammonium nitrate fertilizers can make the soil acidic. You may wonder, mm, we never studied any agriculture in chemistry, but this is an application question. An application question coming from hydrolysis of salts. Do you remember that when you dissolve a salt which is formed from a weak base and a strong acid in water, you're going to get an acidic solution? If you remember that, then you are good to go. And so on and so forth. I've just tried to show you which topics can help you, can guide you when you're writing those, when you are writing the answers to those questions. Those questions are what we call high order thinking. It's not a matter of what you know. You are explaining. Remember, you're going to write equations, you're going to give reasons. So you must think very critically in these questions. Now, let us look at calculations. Let's look at calculations. I know this one is a very, this is very bad news for many of us. The moment you talk about calculations in chemistry, many of us will say, ah, ah we switch off. But we have some calculations which are very simple. You don't have to lose hope right now. We still have enough time to practice these things. And practice is the only medicine to this problem. Now let me talk about them. For calculations in this paper, they must be from first principles. What are the first principles in chemistry? Our first principle is the use of the mole. So when you're doing your calculations, use the mole concept. Do not use formulas in this what? In this paper. Secondly, the level of accuracy, the level of accuracy of your answer should be as that in the question when it comes to rounding off. You may calculate and then you find you have very many decimals following the whole number but we require you to write just a specific one. And how will you know where to stop? When you're rounding off, look at the numbers which have been given in the question. To what the small places are they? Then your answer can be to any of those. When you have these long decimals after your whole number, do not estimate the accuracy by truncating, just chopping, mm, you pull off some. No, make sure you use rounding off rather than truncating. Number three, the chemistry in the statements that you make must be correct. What do I mean that the chemistry must be correct? Listen to this statement. One mole of ethanol produces 1,360 kilojoules of heat. That is from enthalpies of conversion. That statement is very correct. But look at someone who says, 
1,360 kilojoules produce one mole of ethanol. If you are to look just at the values, the one mole is there, the amount of heat is there, and they are correct. But the statement is not bringing out the chemistry. The kilojoules of heat do not produce one mole of ethanol. It is one mole of ethanol that produces that amount of heat. So if that statement is not coming out, is not correct in a chemistry sense, then still even if your calculations are very beautiful, you have an answer, you're going to get everything wrong. Then when you're writing those statements, one mole of ethanol produces 1,360 kilojoules of heat. That is your first statement. Then you want to say, there are for two moles of ethanol will produce this and this and this. Do not use those dotted lines. Do not use those arrows. Do not use those quotation marks. Make sure you are writing the statements out fully at every line. Then when you reach the final answer, you have to make sure that you communicate your final answer appropriately. It must have the units and then it must be clearly underlined. Do not forget to underline your final answer, communicating it clearly. If you have been told to calculate for the mass, tell us therefore the mass, you know, is these grams and then underline your answer. Why do we underline the final answer? Because you were likely to go through a series of steps, many of them calculating different things. So make sure you underline the final thing that has been asked for in the question. Then so what are some of the areas which are rich in calculations? Like I already told you, some of these calculations are cheap. Calculations like empirical formula, molecular formula, these are very simple calculations. By now, if you're having challenges with this, I'm not going to tell you to give up. No, not on empirical formula, not on molecular formula. Get a friend who is well conversant with this, pick some questions and start practicing. I assure you the time is enough for you to calculations. We can deal with calculations around moles in solution things of molarity. We can also be asked to calculate volumes of reacting gases. These ones are even a bit common in paper one. Then we can have mass to mass calculations and mass to volume calculations. With these ones, even your knowledge of writing a balanced chemical equation is very important. So even if you're very good at mathematics, but when equations are giving you a challenge, you will not be able to write some of the to do some of these calculations unless you're lucky enough and the equation has been given. Then even under enthalpy changes, we can have some calculations in that topic. Gas laws. Hey, these ones are rare, but please, they are still part of the syllabus. Revise them and do those questions. Even others which may have forgotten. So we can now look at this example. I did not calculate it because I do not want to be a bad teacher. I want to allow my learners to practice. And if you read through it, you can see that our final answer can be to zero. It can be to one. It can even be to two decimal places because of the values which have been given in the question. 2.72, that's two decimal places. 65.5, that's one decimal place. Then we have 108, that is zero decimal places. So if your answer is matching any of those, it is okay. I have written down a possible route that can be taken to tackle the question. And you can notice for every step that I have written it down, it is relying on the mole, which is our first principle. Calculate the moles, calculate the molar mass, you know, moles, eh? molar mass of zinc chloride. Calculate the moles of zinc chloride. Write a balanced equation. We know that equations are balanced by moles. 
compare the moles using the equation. Convert the moles to mass. I'm talking about moles, moles, moles. Those are our first principles. If you come across a question where you can use a formula and it is in paper two, please remember that you have to answer the question using the mole concept. Do not use the formula. So in your free time, I hope you will try out that question. And I will be glad to see the final answer that you have written down in the comments. Next, we are going to talk about graphs. And I believe graphs are our friends too. Not so. Some of our learners, when you see the graphs, you don't even want to read the next question. Actually, the moment you see a table, you know there is a graph. And you don't want to read the questions before you even start. You're very sure I'm going to do the graph. That's usually in section B. Yes, they are usually a savior in section B. But simple as they may seem, we have to be very careful with them. And I want you to listen carefully. I want you to listen very carefully. Number one, I'm going to explain each aspect of the graph. Number one, do not forget to write the title where at the top of the graph the title must be at the top of the graph. This one should not be a headache in chemistry because in most cases, the question will give you a title for your graph. That is it about writing the title of a graph. Do not forget the title. In case marks are there for the title, don't lose that mark. Number two, the axis. A graph is made of two axes. That is the x-axis and then the y-axis. The x-axis is the one running horizontally, and then the y-axis is the one running vertically. These ones should be clearly labeled with a name, a name, please, a name. Remember even the rules for writing a name. And after the name, you must put the units. If they are there, put the units in brackets together with the name for that axis. The name must, must not be abbreviated and the units must be correct. There is nothing to award for interchange the axis. If you get the parameters for the Y axis and you give them to the X, you get the ones for X and you give them to Y, you have inverted your axis and there is nothing that will be awarded. Nothing, maybe the title if it has a mark, but even the title will be wrong because the title in most cases matches with the axis. So if you interchange them, you're going even to have problems with your title because they will not be rhyming. Then for each axis, there must be a suitable scale. I'm talking about a suitable scale, not just a scale. So what is a suitable scale? In most cases, your teachers will say things like, make sure your graph covers at least three quarters of the graph paper. You've heard of that. But basically, what are they meaning? What they are trying to say is that your graph should be large enough and easy to read. The scale must be large enough and easy to read. This will come in handy somewhere. So what do you do with your scale? Your scale should be written out. Please write the scale. I'm reminding you, write the scale. We usually write it in that top corner on the right hand side. And what is the correct format for writing your scale? We have many formats that rotate around, but let me tell you which one is correct. Number one, your scale must be written in full. Do not use dots, those ratio dots, no. Do not use any arrow, no write the word represents, it must be there in full. And it must be written to one centimeter. For example, maybe on my X axis, I have one centimeter, one the number, CM, a unit, that one is okay. Then the word represents two minutes. I write to a number and then I write minutes. In case you know the correct unit for minutes, 
it is okay, you can write it. But make sure your units are correct. And the, what? The scale is written out in full and to one centimeter. Then another thing you should not do, one small box represents, one big box represents. No, 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 no. Do not say that. You must write the word represents and represents to, you must use one centimeter. So in case you read your scale and maybe there are two centimeters representing the two minutes, go and divide them into the simplest form, which is to one centimeter before you state your scale. Even if you have not plotted anything at one centimeter on your scale, even if you've not put there anything, get whatever you have done and divide it to cover for one. And a reminder, yes, the units for the parameter on the axis must be mentioned in the scale. For ex in the example I gave, if you say one centimeter represents two, even if your axis was clearly labeled that uh, that axis is for minutes and you don't tell me the minutes in your scale, please, that is not correct. And remember the mark for the scale is given to the whole thing. You must get the X correct and then the Y scale also correct, not just one of them. Next, plotting. I've talked about the title, the axis, and the scales. Now I'm going to talk about plotting. Someone is asking, how about two centimeters represent? I've said that one is wrong. You go and divide that such that you get what, what is okay for one centimeter. Do not say two centimeters represents, even if you write it in full, but it is in form of two centimeters represent. That one is not a suitable scale. I hope I have answered your one question. So now when it comes to plotting, be very careful when you are plotting. Be very careful when you're plotting because if you plot wrongly, it is going to affect the shape of your graph. Plotting wrongly is going to affect the shape of your graph. Another thing, Marks are going to be deducted for every point that you're going to plot wrongly. Have you digested that? Marks will be deducted for every wrong plot. Yes, when they are awarding marks to these plots, let's say we have a table and it has 80 points. We do not, we may not have the 80, we may not have marks for the 80 points, but we may say, okay, we can have for four. It's not a guarantee that, yes, as long as I have the first four correct, the other ones can be yeah, overlooked, no. We shall look at the four. Do you have four? Actually, we shall look at the whole thing. Do you have four correct ones? Yes, you get your marks. Then we, may, we go and check each of those plottings. If any of them is wrong, then we are going to cancel one of the correct ones. Are you seeing the repercussions of plotting wrongly? Wrong shape? and then losing marks. For every wrong plot, a mark will be lost for a correct one. So make sure that whatever you have plotted is very correct. And I'm telling you, your scale will help you a lot when you are plotting. If you use a complicated scale, it's going to hinder your accuracy, and then you'll have many problems with your graph. Lastly, I hope is it, Yes, lastly, about your graph, it must have the correct shape. Meaning that even the chemistry this time is needed. There is a time they brought a graph about the changes that happen as you hit a solid. We drew that car graph in senior one. What happens to a solid when it is heated as it changes up to the gaseous state? It has a unique shape. So for someone who did not know that characteristic shape of that graph, they were forced to draw a line of best fit, meaning that they got the shape of the graph wrong. So you must have an idea of the shape of the graph. If you realize that it is a curve, do not use a ruler. Do not join point to point. No, you draw a curve using your free hand. 
And if you realize that it is a straight line, do not force the straight line to go through all the points. Simply get your ruler and you draw a line of best fit. There is a principle that makes the work of examiners very easy when they are marking these graphs. When the scale is wrong, then the plotting is wrong, then the shape is wrong. So someone simply looks at your scale. If there is a problem, you've made their work very easy. Please, let's not lose these marks. Sometimes, before we go to suggest, I'm still on the graphs. Some of these things are not stated in some of those slides. Sometimes you may be required to read a value from your graph. This is when your scale now is going to come in very handy. Is it easy to read? Is it large enough to read? If your scale is okay, well and good. Now, even if you can use your scale to read the value they are looking for, the value they have asked you to find, you must show it on your graph. Let's say they say, please find the enthalpy of heat for this number of carbon atoms. You know that, okay. Now they have given me the number of carbon atoms. That is my starting point. Go to that value. Then show that dotted line moving towards your line, which you drew after plotting. And then when it meets the line, then you know that you have now to draw at 90 degrees, a line which will take you to the opposite axis. That one must be shown. Use your ruler. If you do not show that, there is no working. How sure are we that someone did not just give you the value? Are we together? I hope you understand our reasoning. Why you will not get a mark if you do not show that what? If you don't show those dotted lines. Then even when you're looking, when you're for some questions where you need to read a value outside what you have plotted, be very careful to leave some space on the sides and above such that in case you have to read the value beyond those points, you have space. Otherwise you may plot and then you cannot read the value from your own graph. Okay, La not lastly, but we are coming to the end. We are now going to look at the verb suggest. To suggest, this one simply means that give us an opinion. What do you think? But your opinion must be subjected to reasoning. You must reason. Do not just write anything. Think and then find something which is reasonable. So when they tell you to suggest, it means that you must use the data which has been provided and then you use it to make a conclusion. For example, after calculating the enthalpy of combustion, maybe that one was part A. Part B says, hey, suggest a possible use for substance X, the substance whose calculation you made in the previous question. If you calculated your enthalpy of combustion and you see that you got a very high value, then you can say, hey, a possible use for this substance is that it can be used as a fuel. The reason being that my enthalpy of combustion is high. That is with suggesting. So with suggesting, you must put in a lot of reasoning, a lot of applications. Now, lastly, but not least. Lastly, but not least. Our next slide, the last verb we are going to look at. This one looks straightforward, but still let's listen to it even if it looks straight forward. That is the state or give, same thing. This one usually, in most cases, it usually asks for a limited number of responses. You'll find things like give one, state two. It is limited, do not exceed that. Yes, do not exceed the required number. You may say, ah, for me, I know my chemistry and it's too much. I can give as many responses as I can. Please, any excess answers that you write down, they will not be marked, but, but they will be considered how? The excess answers are not awarded marks, but 
if any excess answer is wrong, they said give two and you give three. If the third one is wrong and you got the other two correct, we are going to come back and cancel one of the correct answers. I think you can see why it's not a good practice for you to give excess answers. First of all, it's wasting your time. The excess answers will not be looked at. The examiner will simply look through and say, seen. Mm -hmm. They will not award marks that will be added onto the rest of the what? Of the marks. Just like this learner, let's look at what this learner did in the next slide. The question said, give two uses of oxygen. But this learn, I think, imagined that they know a lot of chemistry and gave us three. The first answer, correct, used for respiration. The second answer, correct, for welding in the oxyacetylene flame. That is all they wanted, the two uses. This one went on and put there a third answer. It is used to put out fires. And unfortunately, that answer is not correct. That's not a correct use for oxygen. So you can see there is a cross on that answer. And because the question needed only two, the examiner goes back to one of the correct responses, removes the tick and puts their seen. So if each of those users was carrying one mark, Instead of scoring two marks because the student had the two correct answers, they are going to score only one. So please, instead of you giving many answers randomly, that the time allocated to the chemistry paper is mostly for thinking. Most of the time is for thinking rather than writing. You need very little time to write the responses in this paper. Most of the time is for thinking. So think. Pick out your best answers that you're sure of and write those ones in case they tell you to give a limited number of ideas. And that one brings us to the end of our theme for today's facilitation, which is the action verbs used in chemistry 545 stroke two and how to interpret them. I thank everyone who has been able to join. I thank all the schools that have been able to join us. I send kind regards to all the head teachers that are actively participating in this exercise. I would also like to thank the Ministry of Education for giving us a lot of support and Mr. Kaziva who has managed to bring us all together from all parts of the country. Thank you very much. I pray that this idea bears very good fruits in the future. It should not stop this year, it should continue. Many of us are willing to keep on participating and maybe even one time we may meet in, we may meet physically. So, there is that last slide. I would like to emphasize that last slide. That last slide for the students. Do not go for your revision, maybe during preps, to get these concepts in the head. You have to keep on practicing. We say practice makes perfect. But for me, there is a special kind of practice that I encourage my learners to do. Practice and practice and practice and practice. But what's the target of your practicing? Do not practice something until you get it right. Let that one just be the first step. After getting it right, continue and practice until you cannot get it wrong. If you can apply that one, not only in chemistry, but all subjects, arts, science, that principle will help you a lot. I wish you all the best in the forthcoming mock examinations and uh, the final examinations next term. Please, my name is Gloria. I have been presenting from Ivanda physically, but my workplace is in Isinjiro. 
So you can see Uganda is such a small world. Thank you very much for attending. I think I can now answer some of those questions that you have been presenting. Thank you so much, uh, Teacher Gloria, for the wonderful presentation. We cannot thank you enough. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, questions are already on. Uh, let me ask uh, Mary Assumpta to unmute and ask your question. Mary Assumpta. Uh, thank you, sir. The, there is another, I have a question eh, about uh, that part of drawing. There, is, there are some statement or sentence being written that there is no ceiling of gas jars. Now, what do you mean by no ceiling of gas jars? Because for that example, which was given, <clears throat> that uh, gas jar was sealed. And here again, you wrote that there was no ceiling of gas jar. Then the other question is that, can you only draw though a talking diagram when you are told to describe? Thank you. Okay, thank you, our dear learners from Maria Sompta. Let me respond to your questions. The first question you asked is about sealing the gas jar. When, I'm, when I talk about sealing the gas jar, I'm not meaning do not cover. Yes, put a cover, but leave some space. I explained that the use of that space, for example, when we are preparing a gas that is denser than air, as that gas is entering the gas jar, the air must move out. So if you seal the gas jar totally and you enclose it, the air cannot move out. And what is going to happen next is that your gas jar is going to burst. I hope you have understood that. So in that drawing, the learner was able to leave some space. Actually, if you look at some textbooks, they will indicate arrows and then they label them, air moves out. I hope I'm clear on that. If I'm not, I'm ready to listen to you again. Then, oh, I've forgotten your second question. Please forgive me. Can you repeat the second question? Or you can type it in the notes. Sorry, okay, sorry, the, question, sorry. the second question. The second question is that, for example, the second question is that, for example, when you're told to dis uh, describe a uh, maybe preparation of a gas, can you draw though a talking diagram? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very and they, much. And there is also another question, eh, madam? Mm. Uh, in the, for example, in practical, eh, because in that part of titration, most times you are to carry three uh, experiments. Now, the first one, you write the volume. Again, you write for the second one and for the third one. Now, when you are told to uh, calculate the average values, are you going to the first and the second or the second and the third? Okay. All right. All right. So. When the question requires you to describe the preparation of a gas, my dear daughter, if you can draw, if this question has not been specific and they only added for a description, they ask for a description, someone can decide to describe in words and then draw a diagram. Another person can draw a talking diagram. If the question was, not specific because it may say using your of course when they say using a diagram describe a talking diagram is okay but in case they said you they say without the aid of a diagram diagram not required in that case please do not attempt to draw a diagram but if the question is open 
and you draw your diagram very well, working apparatus, correct labeling, and you make it a talking diagram. I hope you remember what a talking diagram is. For example, you label, you label it like thisophano containing dilute hydrochloric acid, which reacts with the calcium carbonate in the flask to produce carbon dioxide gas. If that's the kind of label you have for your dilute hydrochloric acid, it is very, very okay. I hope I have answered that. Then when it comes to the titrations, unfortunately, my facilitation was about paper two, but I think I can answer your question. These two values which you choose in your titration, they must be the closest values next to each other. Do you get me? They must be the closest values next to each other. And they usually have a level of deviation, which they consider a level of deviation from each other. So make sure that the values you're using are the ones closest to one another. I hope I can keep in touch with your teacher and we can elaborate on that question when time allows. But this facilitation was mainly for chemistry paper two and you know some of the principles in paper two do not apply in the practical paper but we shall keep in touch and we shall help you be sure that we shall help you let me respond to some of the questions here should the title in a graph be underlined it is not a must but i would encourage you that if you write your title in capital letters no need to underline if you write in small letters you can underline, but if it's in capital letters, you don't have necessarily to underline. Okay, how about two centimeters represent one unit? That one is not okay. Which unit are you talking about? That's the first error. Then you're saying two centimeters. If you want to follow the, the, the answer, the what? If you want to follow what I'm doing, you can go to the comments section to the chat. That is where I am and that's where I'm replying. So first of all, this one, the problem of saying two centimeters represent that two centimeters must be must be divided to the smallest ratio for one centimeter. That is a problem. And then one unit, what is the unit? Okay, sound not coming out. I hope we rectified that. Then there was an answer here for the calculation. Please, your answer may be correct, but you have to make sure your answer is either to zero decimal places, one decimal place, or two. And this one is one, two, three, four, five decimal places. So you're not going to score for the value. If you are lucky enough that the max can be split up for the value and the units, then you will get for the units, but for the value you will not get. Should the pencil be used in plotting? Chemistry paper two is a free paper. Whether plotting the graphs or you're drawing the setups, you can use a pencil, you can use Teacher Gloria, oh, sorry. Teacher Gloria, okay. Teacher Gloria, you can continue. Teacher Gloria. Oh. Yes, my, my, my screen had gone off. Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh. And as if most of my comments have disappeared, my chat has disappeared since I came back afresh. Maybe someone can keep reading for me some of those 
Let me see that I can share them. Okay. Gloria, are you seeing the chat? I'm going to scroll a bit and we see. I can see a screen. Okay, now we can continue. Let me go up and then we go through them. I'm seeing a different screen. Microsoft, what do you think? What are you seeing now? I'm seeing a screen for Microsoft Word. Hasn't another screen come? Maybe my side, if it has not yet arrived. Hmm. Well, I was sharing the chat, but let me, okay, let me stop sharing. And I... Uh, See whether I can do it. Okay, but let us be answering the question. Uh, Wilson, unmute. Mm. Wilson, unmute. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me, please? Uh, thank you very much, Gloria, for the lesson. I'm calling, I'm talking from Big Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes, it's okay. I'm I can from hear big you. And the My concept is about to empirical formula. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether maybe it jumped off my listening, but I would love you to talk about what decimal places, how do you handle decimal places when you are calculating the morals and the, what we want to use to get the ratio. And two, how about the wordings on the left hand side? Like we do we did it emphasize much about the element, maybe percentage or mass composition, maybe the number of models might divide by smallest. Yes, really Mr. Wilson, I've understood your question. This I would love you to slow when more it light. comes. Yes, please. Okay, I can let get me you. answer your question. When it comes to calculating the empirical formula, you talked about round Yes, yes. Mm, for the calculations at all level, they usually do not disturb learners with very large numbers. But in case it appears, in case it appears, it is okay to round off, but do not over round off. Do not, mm. if you over round off, it may affect your more. Mr. Wilson, do you get me? I get you, please. I get you. Hello? I yes, can get with you, please. Whatever, as I usually give in simpler, simpler values to deal with. Then when it comes to the steps which you are following, the ones you put on the left, the steps which you're yes. going through. Yes. One thing I forgot to mention during this, in case, the, the 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 percentage of what been given the learner must show that working the learner yes. must show the 100 minus whichever values have been given that one is yes. very important then for the step which they are going through it is not necessarily that it should write there but but it may be due to examination pressure it could be to some students when they think they know a lot, these are simple numbers, they may skip some step. Do you get me? 
So I get you, it please. is fine if you do not indicate those steps. But a student who has been indicating those steps, when they start getting a weak answer in their calculations, at least they can trace back the what? The mistake. Okay. So it is up to we have we have individual differences among our learners. If you are okay with doing that thing without any guide, it's okay. If you write there, okay. it is okay. Are we together, Mr. Wilson? Okay. Yes, I can get okay, you. It is okay now. I've got you. What about when we are handling those calculations of like mass, mass, or mass volume? Most especially when you are getting the when you are handling mass, mass or mm. volume of math, our answer is in mass. How do we handle the rounding? The rounding of, I explained that one and I said, for any calculation, look at the values which have been given in the question. Yes. Mr. Wilson, have I answered your question? Okay, yes, please. Mr. Wilson. I can get uh, you. Look please. at the can question and see which the small place you are. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. And do not forget okay, okay. the units. Okay. Yeah. Okay, please. Thank All you very right. much. Mm. Okay, thank you. We request that you you can find a way of sending us those small, those slides. The eh? session has been asked from Maria Swampta. Is it advisable to write the steps? Like I have said, it depends if you're very, you can do. Okay. Uh, teacher Gloria. Oh, okay. We are back. Ciao, Gloria. Yes, I'm back. I had jumped off again. Sorry, sorry. And for those ones who write those steps, if you know that these steps are supposed to be five, let me say, the moment you count them and they are not five, then you will know that I have missed something. I hope I have answered that elaborately. I hope. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for more questions. Okay. Uh, I think let me go to the chat because I've been able to get the other chat. Uh, are you mm -hmm. able to see now my screen now, Chef Gloria? Yes, I can see the screen. Okay, I think uh, we are going to. Uh, Maybe if you can, I don't know if you can help me to zoom. I'm using microphone and it is small. Okay, I'm going to be reading. Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm looking at. Okay, someone was asking, is use of formula correct in writing title of experiment and labeling of drawings? I think I answered that and I was very clear. We do not use formula. This paper, please emphasize the use of names. Okay. Mm. Uh, is, is it that ionic equation with a carbonate ion in, aqu in aqueous state? Okay, for that equation, if you decide to leave the your carbonate in solid state, of course you will write the molecular formula, but you know that there are more ions that will appear the other side, that is the calcium ions, that one is okay. And even writing it in aqueous state, it is okay, because we know that that carbonate is indeed going to dissolve in the acid, and in that reaction we have water, so yes. It will be there in solution. We have water in the acid, which can dissolve that carbonate. So writing it in aqueous, that is the one which I gave is the correct one, writing it in aqueous. But if you write it using the molecular version, 
you will have some ions which will not cancel out. I think it's the calcium ions. They will appear even on the other side. Both are okay. Okay. Another one. Uh, should the title be under, underlined as a must? I explained that. It is your free will. You can underline or, or you can leave it. Okay. Mm. Could the pencil be used in plotting? Yes, it is okay. Chemistry paper two is very free. You can use a pen, you can use a pencil when you're drawing setups, when drawing your graphs, plotting, it is all okay. But if you use a pen and you make an error, look at that situation, and then you have to remove that mistake. That's why if your teacher encourages you to use a pencil, it's not that using the pen is wrong, but what if you make a mistake? That's the basic thing behind it. But if you trust your accuracy, well and good. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, like the convenient graph should cover up to what space? A convenient graph should be one which has a scale that is easy to read and interpret. Whichever size of the graph paper it is covering. When they say three quarters of the graph paper, we know that at least that one is very convenient, but it's not that it is a must. As long as you can easily interpret your scale and you can easily read it, whichever size, whole paper, half paper, three quarters, it is okay. But I think anything less than half will be too small for you to easily read, especially when you are plotting. Do not make your life very hard. There is a lot of pressure in the exam. Why do you want to compound it? Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay, the rest uh, is just a thank you for the beautiful presentation. May the Almighty God continue to break the work of your hands. Thank you, Madam Gloria, for the first citation. Thank you, thank you. The rest was uh, a thank you or not from the uh, okay. from the teachers, and they are kindly asking if you can share them with your number such that they can reach on to you for more questions uh, in such format. Okay, you're welcome, everyone who has been able to attend. I'm in the chat. I'm sharing my number. 0777 43 47 47. I've shared it. That's MTN. Okay. Uh, it seems uh, Mr. Wilson still has a question. Mr. Wilson, unmute. Mr. Wilson, unmute. Okay, I'm seeing Mary Asumta. Do you have a question? I'm seeing students raising up their hands. Mary Asumta. Okay, okay, Mr. Wilson, I'll fail to. Yes. The number, please. Not writing. The number. Madam's number. Madam's number. Okay. Madam's it number. is 0776 43 47 47. It is teacher Gloria. Yes. That's a number. Uh, feel free to reach out to her for any consultation in the chemistry. And I'm sure uh, we shall have her come back uh, to help us uh, with the paper, the other paper, paper three. Uh, but allow me now to, uh, to end here. Any, any other thing, Madam Gloria, before we close? Yes, I just want to reiko my warm gratitude for having this opportunity to present this facilitation. I hope 
we have benefited and it can move us forward. That is it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Mr. Kaziba. Thank you, Mr. Dungu. And all the head teachers who are on the platform, thank you for encouraging your learners to come and attend these Zoom lessons. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay. And uh, we want to thank uh, Teacher Gloria for the wonderful presentation. Teacher Gloria, we are really very, very grateful for the beautiful presentation you have been able to give us this afternoon. Thank you so much. We cannot thank you enough but we are really very grateful and we are praying to God that you may get for us another time to come to us and we share with us your knowledge in paper three. I know because there is a lot we need to learn from you. Students are really very eager and I know we shall have that time to come back online and probably we share a lot. Thank you so much and may the good Lord bless you abundantly. You're welcome. Welcome. Allow me now to welcome uh, the principal in charge of secondary schools at the Ministry of Education, Mr. Ronald, to make his concluding remarks and also to finally close this session. Mr. Ronald, you are most welcome. Mr. Kaziba, I'm not sure whether we reminded the teachers to write for us the name of school and number of people attending and also take pictures for us. I can see St. Mary Assumpta girls. I hope I can, uh, we can have pictures from all the schools uh, present. Please, whoever is still on the call, just take pictures of your students in whichever form they are, whether they are crowding around the projector or they are sitting in uh, good fashion, just take take the pictures because it is very exciting to see the faces. I, I want to thank uh, teacher Gloria for the wonderful presentation. And I think teacher Gloria has given us another option because she started by wanting to play a recorded video, which I think Mr. Kaziba, we can think about because somebody may want to present but is not able to present at that time, but can actually record a video for us. And we play the video and another teacher can add to the video. I think that is also another dimension we want to go with. But I also wanted to say that if I had been part of teacher Gloria's class or facilitation before I did my O levels, I think I would have done better in chemistry. And this is very important that we continue these sessions. I know they will grow, um, especially after mocks, they will grow bigger and uh, we'll have more people coming in. And for the people participating now, the students, if they can perform well in their mock time, I think that will be good. I only want to request the schools to make sure that they take down the recordings and that last evening, when tomorrow we are doing chemistry, let us play this recording again and listen in to remind ourselves about um, the facilitation and also go with it towards your name because once we remember all these tips, then I think we shall be better uh, candidates going forward. So I want to thank the teachers, the school leaders who are making this possible. I want to thank um, Mr. Kaziba with your holistic e-learning team. I want to thank all our partners who are joining in to ensure that we stay afloat and to thank the schools and the teachers for allowing the learners to participate. But most importantly, the teachers who are using their own airtime, their own time, we are not paying them. And dear students, wherever you are, you should clap for the teachers. Let me see the person clapping. Clap and we see you clapping. Yes, yes, we have seen you clapping. Teachers, the students are very happy that you are presenting, you are giving them your time. I want to wish everybody a good evening and let us plan to come back tomorrow uh, ready to listen in to yet new the other subjects. With that, 
I want to wish everybody a good night and those who can open your cameras like Maria Sumta has done, open your cameras so that we take the last pictures. We want to see you where you are, whether you are alone or you are many, open your cameras and Mr. Kaziba can also take, can take the photographs um, of those who are online. And with that, I want to say that this session is now closed until tomorrow. Bye-bye.